when I found out that, you know, there was no commencement, it just really hurt. Like they took something away from me, like something that I can't get back. The class sizes will have to be reduced. The numbers of students riding school buses will have to be reduced. We knew that we needed to have a site right here in our communities where people can walk and come get tested. Now we are learning about a mysterious inflammatory illness. Now this syndrome is rare, but it can happen. Do you feel that Renee Coleman Mitchell was just not doing a good enough job for what was facing the state? No, I think the job has changed. Let me put it that way. People are calling, but we don't know what to tell them. We don't know when we're going to be able to sail. It's hard enough on a regular day. To make it, we need to be open. I haven't had a paycheck in eight weeks. It's 100% necessity. If it's too crowded, I just won't go in. We don't even know what products are going to be available, what we're going to have to offer this year. You know, the six feet distancing rule, you know, it's virtually impossible for us to do that. I'm not worried whatsoever about making sure that we don't have any cross-contamination. I am a sanitizing crazy person. Thinking about pandemics is not like a weather forecast. We don't have those kind of tools that tell us exactly what's going to happen. Live from WFSB, this is a special edition of Face the State with Dennis House, coronavirus in Connecticut. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Dennis House. Welcome to this special live Thursday night edition of Face the State, where we are asking the governor of our great state of Connecticut the questions you have been asking us to put his way. Welcome, Governor Lamont, joining us now from the executive residence remotely, and hopefully one of these days soon we'll be able to have you live here on the program in person. I'm looking forward to that day, Dennis. I know you've had a busy couple of weeks talking about this reopening on May 20th. Tell us exactly what will reopen on May 20th, which is next week. Yeah, we had a whole set of metrics that we had to hit in order to get May 20th as an opening date. What that means for outside dining, what that means for uh, hair, what that means for barbers, uh, what that means for non-essential businesses on Main Street. It's a partial, very careful reopening. It's baby steps, but it's a big step for us. We have a lot of families watching, a lot of parents watching right now. They want to know, can their kids get together next week with friends, perhaps in groups of five or ten? What is the limit? Right now, we said for social gatherings, five. You know why? Because we're talking about contact tracing. We're saying we're going to do a lot more testing. And if you're tested positive, somebody will contact you and they'll say, who have you been in close contact with over the last four or five days? And if you've had groups of 10 or so, it's a lot tough, 20, it's a lot tougher to contact trace. If you've limited the number of interactions you've had, um, it's a lot easier to make sure we keep the pandemic under control. So if someone's planning a Memorial Day cookout for 20 people, they shouldn't be doing that? Uh, my recommendation would be uh, don't do that or keep a broad distance. Let's talk about phase two. When is that and what will be opening in phase two? Well, let's get through May 20th, and then the two, three weeks later, we take a look. We see that uh, the restaurants were operating outside. People followed the protocols. They were wearing masks. They had gloves for the waiters, six feet apart. They really sanitized the tables in between um, meals. And then we say, all right, it seemed to work pretty well. Maybe we'll take a second look at um, indoor dining on June 20th. One That's the, the way we think about these things. One of the topics, Governor, we keep getting questions about is high school graduations. Kids and parents are telling us they want to have some sort of a ceremony, even if they're six feet apart when they walk across and get that you know, diploma they've worked so hard for all these years. Do you expect that there'll be an executive order signed by you that will give them permission to start planning these things? Yeah, my, um, I think for May and June, the idea of a big outdoor graduation, I think, is, uh, is probably too much too soon. I think you can see uh, drive-through graduations, Zoom graduations, a variety of different ways amazing superintendents have brought to us. But having a few hundred people, even in a football stadium, seems a little risky. But then maybe mid-June, we take a look at what July and August looks like. If we keep everything on a trend line, keep the infection positivity rate getting lower and lower, they will feel a little more confident, but not yet. So it's possible there could be one in July, but not May or June is what you're saying. I think that's right. Yeah. Let's talk about traditional 
all American summer activities. We have some viewer questions now. Val reached out to us wanting to know about amusement parks. They're outside. What about pools, public ones that cool everyone down in the summer? Even pools in the backyard. Is there a way that these activities can be enjoyed safely? Well, pools in your backyard are, are um, your pool. Uh, municipal pools are certainly up to the local mayor, but social distancing there is uh, very, very important. In terms of other summer activities, um, we're going to get summer camps going probably, um, you know, late June. Those are important. You say, how come no classes but summer camps? One's inside, the other is outside. Smaller groups, say 10 people in a summer camp. Keep them spread apart. I think uh, we, can, we can do that safely. And it's really key to a lot of um, moms and dads who are trying to get back to work and trying to balance kids along the way. I want to talk about Little League Baseball. Will there be a season at all? Our producer just spoke with one of the Little League presidents in the northeastern part of our state. He and representatives about a, about a, from about a dozen towns or so are actually meeting right now. They've been told their health districts are telling them it looks like they might be able to start in mid-June as part of Phase 2. And, of course, they'll work with your guidance, the best practices of the Little League International Group. Thoughts on that? Uh, I'd like to see it. I don't know about mid-June, but I certainly think that uh, baseball, there's, um, it's, it's not like football, a little easier social distancing there. Um, young people, I think that's something we can get done. But again, let me um, listen to our uh, Reopen Connecticut committee. They're going to give us a final report, their final report, which I think is next Wednesday. Is that May 20th? And um, I'll get them to stick around a little extra longer so you can ask them a lot of questions. You know, you and I have been fortunate with our health during this pandemic, as many other people, but so many families have lost loved ones. We received this email from Sandy in Middletown, who writes about the loss of her mother. She says, we're having a funeral for my mother at the end of July. It'll be family only at the cemetery. If we are all six feet or more apart with masks, why are only 10 people allowed? We have 25 family members who want to go. And it's interesting because... So many people, you go to Home Depot, there's 100 people there, or other stores, there are a lot of people. And so people are wondering why these funerals have to be so small. Well, let's see where you are at the end of July, if that's what I uh, heard the question. Uh, we may have, um, you know, different uh, metrics at that point. But I got, you got to remember something. I mean, New Rochelle, which was probably the epicenter of uh, the COVID explosion going back almost three months ago now, that was a funeral. That was where a lot of people were packed in, and it was a very spiritual, religious experience, but the, that didn't deter the uh, germ. We're back now with Governor Lamont. Governor Lamont is joining us from the executive residence in the city's west end. Thank you, Governor, once again for being with us. We continue to get questions about holding weddings. I know your daughter Emily is getting married at the end of the summer. We have two questions today. Anita says, my question is, I'm supposed to be getting married in September, and with the virus, I'm not sure I can still have my wedding. And if I can, how many guests can I invite? Caitlin says, we have no idea if we'll be able to hold our event or not. We understand there are different phases, but if we could get more clarity about a target date for outdoor and indoor weddings, I would, it would be a huge help. Specifically, will indoor weddings be allowed in September? Governor? Let me just say something. I'm picking up a theme here. It's... Um Funerals, weddings, graduations, <laughs> uh, maybe a little sports. And I, I feel like such a Scrooge. I, I feel like the guy's saying, uh, we got to go slow. This pandemic's the likes of which we've never seen before. We think we've got it under control, but every day is unexpected. Look what it was like two months ago. And so it's tough for me to predict what it's going to be like two months from now. Look how much has changed. I think we're taking cautious steps every day. And uh, look, what I tell um, Emily is um, if the trend lines continue, if people are serious about the social distancing, give us a little more time. Every day we're going to make some progress. Then we can continue to open the lens. And um, hopefully by August, September, we can have um, probably bigger events, including a wedding. But uh, I would strongly favor outside over inside. Are companies legally bound, caterers and so forth, to give money back to the couple that's getting married if the state is saying that they should not be having this wedding? Yes, I think they are. Uh, you know, that was part of the reason for the earliest executive orders, so that um, people who are going out on a carnival cruise lines or something, if I had the order saying, um, stay safe, stay home, that meant they could get their refund. 
I think the same principle holds. We have a question about crowds. Many are commenting that people are out and about shopping at those home and garden stores, grocery stores, big box stores. They're acting like we're not in the middle of a pandemic because certain items are being sold there that are not essential. And more than that, another observation is a notable number of people apparently are not wearing masks. Lisa in Torrington writes, I work for a bank inside a grocery store. Though most people do wear masks, there are still plenty of people coming into the store without them. And the staff does not approach these people at all. Who should be enforcing this and why is it not being enforced? Well, first of all, uh, it is an executive order. If you're inside, you're at a bank, you're at a hardware store, whatever it might be inside, employees should wear a mask and uh, customers should wear a mask. Number one point of enforcement, I think, would be you. You go up to somebody and say, I understand uh, you, you should be wearing a mask. That's the rule here in the state. It's not about you. It's about all of us. You're keeping us safe. Show that basic respect. I'd like to see the proprietor of that particular store go to a customer or an employee and say the same thing. And by the way, if you don't feel comfortable, you think that's sort of pushy, um, we have a hotline. Give us a call and we'll have some authorities stop by and give a friendly reminder. This is the law. Governor, I want to ask you about contact tracing. I know it's it's complex, but how many viewers, uh, so many of our viewers are asking about how it's actually being done here. Is the state hiring contact tracers like surrounding states are doing? Not yet. We have uh, hundreds of volunteers that have come forward. Uh, UConn has a class on contact tracing. Maybe we'll get some more. We're working with our local health departments. Um, and uh, right now we have, um, you know, three or 400 folks out there right now, mainly on a volunteer basis doing this. Each contact tracer can handle maybe uh, 12 different um, uh, calls a day. And that means 12 people, they find a tested positive for COVID. We see who you're in contact with. They in turn say, I saw these eight people and we reach out to them. And by the way, Dennis, it's not all by telephone. Maybe it's a text message, maybe it's email, however people feel the most comfortable. And it is voluntary. Although if you really care about the families and the people you are in contact with, let us know because we want to keep them safe. Absolutely. All right, Governor.